Recently, while researching American Steamship, the shipping company started by Bolin and Cornelius in 1907, I stumbled upon a small mystery. On the Bowling Green State University's Historical Collections of the Great Lakes Database, wow, is that a mouthful. While searching through ships that were once owned by American Steamship, I stumbled upon two entries that I could find no reference to on any other site that I used to verify details. The Jason and Achilles suddenly became very interesting to me, because it seemed that nobody knew much of anything about either of these ships. Over the next few weeks, I spent a lot of time scouring the internet for any vague details on these ships, or their careers, and after a while, I think I finally managed to piece together the story of what exactly happened with these two very little known ships. Granted, I had to jump to a few conclusions along the way, but from my understanding, this is the strange story of how two naval World War I fleet colliers became part of the American Steamship Company. The classification of early 20th century naval colliers is a little bit tricky. For example, when researching the USS Cyclops a few years ago, I read on Wikipedia that it is part of the Proteus class, which was comprised of four ships. Recently, when I did more research, however, it turns out that Wikipedia was way off. The Proteus class was built two years after the USS Cyclops. They were 20 feet shorter, 2 feet narrower, and had one less funnel. Don't believe everything you read on the internet, folks. To sum up the subject, in the early 1900s, the Navy had a handful of outdated colliers and needed some better ones. From 1907 to 1912, they contracted five different shipyards to build six classes of specialized colliers for a total of 12 ships. Two of the ships were almost immediately reconfigured into repair vessels. Another one, the USS Jupiter, was later converted into the USS Langley, the Navy's first aircraft carrier. The USS Cyclops, which was the only ship in its class, disappeared into the Bermuda Triangle in 1918, never to be seen again. This made it into a bit of a legend, and it's made a few appearances in pop culture over the years. It was even featured in Clive Cussler's novel Cyclops, which despite being the title of the book, the Cyclops really only played a very small role in the story. Strangely enough, the USS Proteus and USS Nereus would also disappear into the Bermuda Triangle, but this time it'd be in 1941. Each disappeared within a month of each other, shortly after being sold into the Canadian Merchant Navy. All of this is a fairly interesting topic, but we're getting into the weeds now, so let's get back to the Orion-class colliers. Built by the Maryland Steel Company in Sparrows Point, Maryland, the Orion-class were essentially a slightly modified version of the Neptune-class. The Neptune class, which was an improved version of the USS Cyclops, consisted only of the USS Neptune at the time, but would later also bear the USS Jupiter. Other than being just six feet shorter than the USS Neptune, which was built by the same yard earlier that year, the Orion class's key difference was that they were being framed using the new and popular Isherwood system. By framing the ship along its length rather than vertically, the vessels would be lighter than conventionally framed vessels and have additional longitudinal strength. The new identical sisters, USS Orion and USS Jason, would have a waterline length of 514 feet, a beam of 65 feet, and a draft of nearly 28 feet. Six self-trimming cargo holds were rated to hold over 11,000 tons of coal, in addition to the ship's 2,200 tons of bunker coal. Additionally, a lower set of tanks were built to hold over a quarter million gallons of fuel oil. Along their decks, each ship featured seven pairs of lattice towers. Each of these towers supported a coaling boom used to deliver coal to other ships. This was done by clamshell loaders that were capable of discharging over 125 tons per hour. Beneath each of the ship's twin funnels sat a vertical triple expansion steam engine. Combined, they would produce over 6,900 horsepower to a set of twin props that turned at 95 RPMs, capable of propelling the ship at a brisk 14 knots. All these stats come from the book International Marine Engineering Volume 17, so they're probably at least a little bit accurate. The naval career of the USS Jason started off with a bang. In March of 1931, as she was getting ready to go out for sea trials, a British steamer loaded with 300 tons of dynamite exploded only 1,100 feet away from her. The damage was so severe that it delayed the commissioning of the ship until later that June. For the next year, the USS Jason would be refueling ships in the Caribbean and Mediterranean seas. In 1914, she would carry refugees from Tuxpan, Mexico to Louisiana. Later that year, she would be dubbed the Christmas Ship after being loaded with a cargo of Christmas presents bound from New York to the Mediterranean. 
During the war, the USS Jason would mostly work along the Atlantic coast. But in early 1918, she did carry a cargo of aviation parts across the Atlantic to Scotland. After the war, she made a few trips across the Atlantic and even went over to the west coast a few times. In 1920, when the Navy began giving its ships designations, the USS Jason was designated AC-12. The following year, she was loaded with airplanes and sent to Guam. For the next few years, she seemed to jump from the Atlantic to the Pacific routes until later being assigned to the Asiatic fleet. Her assignment there was to be stationed in the Philippines and to replace the USS Ajax as a depot ship. In 1930, she was converted to a seaplane tender and given the new designation AV-2. This would only last a few years though, and in 1932, the USS Jason would be sent to the Breverton Naval Yard in Puget Sound where she would be decommissioned. There she'd sit for four more years until being stricken from the Naval Registry. The last clear record of the USS Jason was that she was towed from Seattle to New York in October of 1936. Everything beyond that is very murky. The USS Jason had the luxury of being built into one of the largest navies in the world where even the construction and career of a lowly collier was well documented and easily available on the internet. The Achilles had no such luxury, even though she was technically a government vessel and based on existing naval designs. In 1914, the Isthmian Canal Commission, a federal commission organized to oversee and manage the construction of the Panama Canal, put it in order to the Maryland Steel Company for two colliers. In the years leading up to this order, the USS Orion and USS Cyclops had been regularly running coal down to Panama. It was likely decided that it'd be less of a burden for all parties involved if the company just had their own ships to deliver their coal for them. Given that the shipyard had just completed the Orion class two years earlier, it was likely decided just to modify those plans for the new pair of ships. Ordinarily, the details of constructions of ships like these can only be found by digging through old boxes locked away in some dusty old records room. Thankfully, though, a very detailed article was written in International Marine Engineering. Not only did the article contain really great pictures and drawings of the ship's lines, but it also discussed a lot of the ship's specifications. The hull dimensions were virtually identical to the Orion class, but details become very different beyond that. The Ulysses class ships carried none of the Orion class's unloading equipment. Instead of seven pairs of lattice towers, these ships featured five pairs of king posts to open the ship's hatch covers. The cargo space was also divided into four cargo holds instead of six. This configuration gave the ships about 2,000 tons more draft displacement than their naval cousins. One of the most obvious differences between the two classes, though, was the lack of twin smokestacks on the Ulysses and the Achilles. Despite the engine configuration being very similar to the Orion class, the Ulysses class ships were capable of producing 300 more horsepower and required only one funnel instead of the two. The ships were rated for a design speed of 14 knots but the Achilles managed to top out at 15.2 during the speed trials with an average running speed of 14.2 knots. The details of the Achilles career back then are extremely vague. In the years following her purchase, company records mention a proposed conversion of her boilers from coal burning to oil firing. There is also mention of a failed attempt to order another set of colliers around this time. This set, however, was to be equipped with the unloading equipment that was not optioned the first time around so it seems there may have been a little bit of buyer's remorse there. What we do know is that the Achilles and Ulysses spent many years running coal from Hampton Roads to Cristobal, Panama, at least until 1929. After this point, they no longer appear in any ship registries. What happened to them after 1929 is a bit of a mystery, but the two were likely placed into some mothball fleet on the East Coast. Sadly, this would be the fate of many ships left over after World War I, and going into the Great Depression, the future was only looking bleaker. There isn't much we do know about the Jason and Achilles careers of the American Steamship Company, but there is a breadcrumb-like trail of facts that we can follow to piece together the most probable story. The problem is that some of these facts will outright contradict other facts we learn along the way. I can't guarantee any degree of accuracy to this account, but I can assure you I spent a lot of time researching this, and have used my best judgment to try to clear up what exactly happened. While the Achilles' new career with American Steamship seems to have begun in 1935, we have to go back a bit further to 1931. With the Great Depression driving the demand for steel down, shipping on the Great Lakes took a hard impact. 
A lot of major fleets were taking huge losses during this time. Two-thirds of the ore carriers on the Great Lakes were sitting idle in long-term layups, and virtually no new ships were being built. This would be a defining moment for American steamship, who were also suffering from heavy financial losses due to the failing economy. Fortunately for them, it would be company co-founder Adam E. Cornelius, who would come up with a new strategy to save the company during these troubling times. While it was true that many of the single-purpose fleets were suffering, a few smaller fleets with a wider variety of older ships were actually getting a little bit more business. Most of the ships of the day were specifically designed to move large cargoes of iron ore, but older and more smaller vessels were able to shift to new cargoes that required travel up rivers and canals that behemoth ore freighters just couldn't reach. Cornelius began to realize that if American steamship were to survive the struggling times, they would need to adapt. During the winter of 1931, three of their ships would be converted to self-unloaders by the American shipbuilding company's yard in Lorain, Ohio. The Theodore H. Wickwire Jr. would be rechristened the Thunder Bay Quarries. The Lewis R. Davidson would become the Diamond Alkali, and the William T. Roberts would become the Dow Chemical. The new unloading equipment and hold modifications would slightly reduce the ship's carrying capacity, but it would greatly reduce their unloading times and increase the versatility in their cargo runs. No longer would they be forced to rely on dock equipment for lengthy unloads. They could now unload themselves at virtually any dock that they could get close enough to reach. The strategy proved to be so successful that American Steamship would go on to convert at least one ship per year for nearly the remainder of a decade. Even the fleet's flagship, the John J. Boland, would be converted in 1935, and the Adam E. Cornelius would as well in 1942. Before we get off topic though, we need to go back to Baltimore, where one can only guess that the Achilles was likely collecting dust and growing rust in a long-term layup. Given that it was the height of the Great Depression, there would seem to be no hope in sight for the old ship. That is until American Steamship apparently purchased the Achilles, and had her converted into a self-unloading vessel. I haven't been able to determine which shipyard did the conversion, but it was most likely done at one of the two yards at Bethlehem Shipbuilding's Key Highway Division in Baltimore, Maryland. It's not clear how long the conversion took, but a photo on American Steamship's own website declares that the Achilles was their first unloader to go on active duty on the Atlantic Seacoast in 1935, so it must have been completed that year. The following year, records indicate that American Steamship Company also purchased the former USS Jason. But strangely enough, the details of its conversion are much, much muddier. The last known record of the Jason was that it was being towed to New York in October of 1936. Whether this is when American Steamship took possession of her or not is unclear, but it is suggested that she was purchased that year. However, the same record also indicates that the Jason would not be converted to a self-unloader until 1940. So why did American Steamship wait so long to convert it? I have no clue. What I do know, though, is that the Great Lakes Red Book does not have any listing of the Jason until their 1940 issue. What likely occurred is that the ship was purchased somewhere between 1936 and 1940. What we do know is that it was converted to a self-unloader like the Achilles in 1940. The conversion is similarly listed as the Achilles conversion. And since Bethlehem's Fairfield shipyard wasn't in business until 1941, it was most likely also done at one of Bethlehem's key highway yards. To my knowledge, this picture taken off the coast of North Carolina in 1943 is the only picture that exists of the Jason after its conversion. For the longest time, this was the only photo I could find of either of these ships, and it only added to the mystery. This ship is clearly a self-unloader that would look at home on any of the Great Lakes, but here it is in the Atlantic Ocean. To muddy the waters further, the uniform paint scheme and lack of stack markings, or even the ship's name, make it difficult to determine what ship this actually is or who it belongs to. This was likely done purposely to protect the ship during the war, and the fear of German U-boats off the Atlantic coast was an all too dangerous reality at the time. It wouldn't be until later when I discovered numerous photos of the Achilles in full American steamship colors that I'd be certain that these two ships were indeed part of the fleet. So did they ever operate on the Great Lakes? From everything I've read, there's absolutely no evidence that the Jason or the Achilles ever came near the lakes. It looks like their primary purpose was to run coal along the east coast. The only clear evidence I could find about their shipping routes was found in a document from 1948 about congressional hearings discussing the dredging of the Bridgeport Channel in Connecticut. 
A couple of statements expressed concerns about the need for a deeper channel so that vessels with deeper drafts would be able to run coal up the channel to the power station. It specifically named the Jason and Achilles as the only vessels at the time with a shallow enough draft to unload at their coal dock. The document would also give some insight on the fate of these two ships. Mr. Richard Van Horn, Vice President of the United Illuminating Company of New Haven, would address a growing concern of the channel in his statement. For all many years, coal has been delivered to this dock by two colliers, the steamship Jason and the steamship Achilles. Both of these colliers are of 28 feet draft, 550 feet long, and 11,000 tons capacity. Also, and most important, they are equipped with self-unloading conveyor belts, capable of unloading 1,000 tons of coal per hour. Inasmuch the tide drops 6 feet in 6 hours, these boats can, by judicious choice of docking time, be sufficiently light at low tide to be afloat. However, the steamship Achilles is on a commission due to unseaworthiness, and the steamship Jason is undergoing extensive repairs. And there seems to be considerable doubt as to how long the steamship Jason can be continued in operation. To our knowledge, the steamship Jason is the only self-unloading collier on the eastern seaboard. The statement goes on to explain that conventional vessels would become grounded as the tide dropped as they waited for the land-based equipment to slowly unload their holds. The only alternative if the channel was not deepened would be to ferry coal up the channel by barge at considerable cost to them and the cost of power would go up significantly to the growing community. I have no idea whether they got their channel dredged or not, but this statement does paint a revealing picture of the state of the Jason and Achilles during 1948. The Jason was on her last legs, and there was significant doubt to how much longer she could stay in service. Worse yet, the Achilles was already so worn out that she'd been laid up and deemed unseaworthy. The future of these two ships seemed to be looking pretty grim. So what happened to the two ships? The Great Lakes Red Books make no mention of them past their 1946 edition. The Bowling Green State University Great Lakes Historical Collection claims that the Jason was dismantled in 1948 and the Achilles was scrapped in 1954. This halfway lines up with shipbuildinghistory.com's records for Bethlehem Sparrows Point Shipyard, which lists both ships as being scrapped in 1948. Where the ships were scrapped isn't listed anywhere, so tracking down that information would be difficult. I'm inclined to believe that the Achilles was likely scrapped along with the Jason in 1948. Both ships are at a breaking point in their careers. And while they were extremely critical to supplying coal to New Haven, they were likely just no longer economically feasible to continue running. It seems that none of these World War era colliers were built with long-term use in mind. By 1948, the Jason and Achilles were all that were left of the original 12 colliers. The Jason had managed to outsail the Cutting Torch 15 years longer than her sister the USS Orion, who was sold for scrap in 1933. The Achilles, however, had only managed to outlive the Ulysses by four years, as the former collier had exploded in 1944, only a few years after being converted into the tanker San Blas. The purchase and conversion of these ships by American Steamship had seemingly given them a new lease on life, if even for a brief period. All the other colliers that were sold into merchant service saw unfortunate ends shortly after their purchase, so it's fair to assume that American Steamship had done more than the other companies to protect their interest in the ships. The real question I'm wondering is why didn't American Steamship continue to build their Atlantic Coast fleet? From Mr. Van Horn's statement, we can see that there was at least some demand for self-unloading coal shipment along the East Coast. Surely they could have purchased and converted more vessels. In fact, they would purchase the C-4 troop transport Marine Angel in 1952 and the T-2 tanker Archer's Hope in 1956. Both ships would even be converted into bulk freighters in Maryland before being moved into the lakes where they had respectively become the McKeesons and the Joseph S. Young. Perhaps they just didn't want to deal with the troublesome upkeep that comes with saltwater ships. By the early 1950s, John Boland Jr. and Adam Cornelius Jr. had joined their fathers in running the company and together they were planning a major expansion to their fleet. Maybe they just decided to focus all their attention on the Great Lakes. Whatever the reason, researching the story of the Jason and Achilles was a fun little side project. And I hope you got as much enjoyment falling down this rabbit hole as I did. Thanks for watching.